X Files Rewatch podcast. I'm Nick. And I'm Kim. And I think we still don't have any news, do we? No, not really. It's just a quiet time for the X Files, apparently. I mean, that's fine. I mean, we are we are coming into the it kind of I also want to say about the doldrums at this point, aren't we? I don't think you can call it the doldrums of the series, not just yet. Okay, maybe not yet. We've got some time to go before the doldrums. We're on the downward <laughs> slide, though, aren't we? Yeah, we are certainly. Well, lots of people consider the X Files heyday to be around season four or five. And um, we are fair. way past that now. Yeah. I mean, I would have said two or three, but then we discovered how many bad episodes there actually are back there. Mm. Which is a lot more than I thought there were. Yeah, I think season four is probably a safe bet. It's starting to dip towards the end of season five, but season four was pretty strong in the whole. It's true. Whereas, well, we'll get to that. We need to, we need to talk about existence first. Yep, the final episode of season eight. Directed by Kim Manners. Written by... And first broadcast on the 20th of May 2001. So there's lots of guest stars, but most of them we have handled before. But we have one new one, who is Dale Dickey, who played the Game Warden. Didn't even get a name. No. She was in Super 8. Oh, okay. Uh, Iron Man 3. Mm-hmm. Frasier. A League of Their Own, the Amazon TV series. And the Fallout TV series. I think she's the kind of scrapper antique dealer lady. A metal box containing the remains of Billy Miles is brought to a coroner. The coroner examines it and notices what appears to be a metal vertebra. After he leaves the room, the metal vertebra begins to spin, going into what looks like the beginnings of a metallic spine. In Skinner's office, a surveillance camera shows Billy Miles leaving the morgue alive and well. Questioned by Skinner and Mulder and Doggart, Crycheck reveals that Miles is a new type of alien replacement agent, and there are others like him. Doggart is called out of the office on behalf of his source, Noel Rohr, who claims that Miles is part of a secret military project to create super soldiers. Now, Scully had a chip put into the back of her neck during her abduction to make her pregnant with the first organic version of a super soldier. Suddenly, Miles appears at the FBI headquarters. Says in this, Krychek tries to escape with Skinner in pursuit. Miles appears behind them. Krychek and Skinner manage to escape in an elevator, but Miles' hand breaks through the elevator door, injuring Skinner and knocking him unconscious. At the hospital, Doggart relates Rohr's claims to Mulder, who rejects the story. The two agents set out to find out how trustworthy Rohr really is. As they observe the FBI garage, they see Krychek and Rohr arriving in a car. Doggart covertly pursues Rohr and sees him in meeting with FBI agent Train. After learning of this, Mulder believes that Crane gave Krychek access to the FBI. Suddenly, Krychek smashes the car window and crushes Mulder's phone. Krychek threatens Mulder with a gun, but is disarmed and eventually shot dead by Skinner. Doggart confronts Rohr and Crane, but ends up being chased by the two. The pursuit ends violently with Crane being run over and Rohr crashing his car into the garage wall, going up in flames. Both men are presumed dead, but later disappear. Meanwhile, Scully and Reyes have arrived in Georgia at an abandoned town to hide Scully and her unborn child. They are detected by a female trooper who agrees to bring them supplies for the birth. At night, Miles attacks the hideout, but is shot dead by the trooper. Scully goes into labour, while a revived Miles and other alien super soldiers surround the house. A trooper revealed to be another super soldier exclaims that this baby will be born. Monica Reyes helps Scully deliver an apparently normal baby, with the super soldiers witnessing the birth in a cold stare. Without explanation, the aliens leave the area as Mulder arrives in the helicopter. At the FBI headquarters, Doggart and Reyes report to an enraged Deputy Director Alvin Kirsch, who objects to Doggart co-opting Reyes to the X-Files without his permission. Doggart retorts by informing Kirsch that he is himself under investigation after a late-night meeting between him, Roar, and Crane. Mulder visits Scully and her baby William at her apartment. After marvelling over the baby and the discussing recent events, the two share a long, passionate kiss. Aww. It's very cute, isn't it? I mean, Scottishship is, yeah, you got what you wanted. Now let's trash this joint. It's not a terrible episode. It's not a terrible episode, but I think it there's some bits where you can say this was a three-parter cut down to a two-parter. Mm, probably fair. Because it's things like let's go find out how trusty Neil, um, Noel Rohr is. And then they come back, well, we couldn't find out anything about Noel Rohr. But was there a scene here? And I don't get the super soldiers at all. I, I know the usual defense of this is, they're aliens we aren't possibly going to understand. There is another fan defense of them, actually. And I think I agree with their reading of this episode, though I feel the episode could have spelt it out. They just needed one line to do so, basically. Okay, I'm interested. It's the bit at the end where, as you described it, the aliens watch the birth, and then without a word, they turn around and just walk away and leave them. Yeah. It's because they were expecting the baby to be something supernatural, and when it's born, it's completely normal. So therefore, um, they're no longer okay. interested in it. Okay, that, that, that would have made more sense. Mm. 
But you need a kind of disgruntled alien saying, oh, but Is that it? that's just a normal baby. <laughs> Vumpf. To really kind of just hammer that home, because I didn't think it's terribly clear that that's what happened in the episode. No, and I would argue that it doesn't look like that at all. It looks like they wanted to be present for the birth. Because I know that's a Series 10 comic that gets into this a lot more. There is, yeah. That we'll get to... Because I think Season 10, we're going to have to contrast the two together, because that's going to be a fun yeah, discussion. I've read the Season 2 comic, which was what was released before there was even an idea there was going to be a Season 10 of the series. And so it kind of connects a little better to this episode. Yeah. So I think we'll save that for then. But mm. the impression I got, and it's hard not to see this with all the biblical stuff we've crammed in here, because we've gone all out on biblical imagery. We've said throughout the series that there has been this kind of biblical bent to everything thing particularly with Mulder's resurrection but this episode it, it, the subtext has become text yeah this this is the birth of christ we can't really get away from it there's a bright star in the sky <laughs> everyone comes to witness the birth even Mulder is drawn there you know knowing by following the bright light to bethlehem i, I mean georgia yeah and i'm never going to complain about the lone woman being an episode but they appear as the three wise men bearing gifts at the yeah, end and it's you cut in some senses it's a case of okay you were trying to be a little bit more subtle. Mm. You failed, but you tried to be more subtle. At the same time, just have them show up with Mulder. Have them co-op them and then they track down where the UFO is by the seeing where the light is in the sky or something. I think the only thing we're lacking really is Scully giving birth in a manger. You could see, you could see the tug there. With it, there and we could have put her in the barn. We could have put her in the barn. I remembered them actually saying what the light was. I'd forgotten that it doesn't get an explanation. No, it's a star or an UFO, you don't know which. Yeah, but it's... I think the weird thing about that is, if you wanted to, in the even with the X-Files normal symbolism, you could just have a ship overhead, shining a beam down onto them. Mm. And that would have been your guiding star. And But they went for a lot, bit more metaphorical, in this case of Mordor was drawn there, but the star is... If it's overhead anything, it's like several miles away from them. It's not overhead of where Scully is. No. So that was weird. And, yeah, we have the virgin birth, but not really. And then there's that thing about Dog that was born where they've gone to have Scully's child, which is a... a not you detail. don't know it's the house. He might be born in the area. But it's still not detail to put in there. Mm. And we could make the argument, and we're going to get back to it a bit later, of where Mulder was born would have made, oh, I can see that fin together a bit nicer, but is that too obvious? I'm still going to argue that if you're going on the logic of... We want to send Scully somewhere where they don't know where it is. We're not going to send her to Martha's Vineyard. No. But it turns out it doesn't matter that no one knew where they were because Doggett called Rails on an FBI internal line and didn't just wait till she showed up with the car then told her in person. Of course not. There's a bloody great star over it. <laughs> exactly. So, But then Billy Marl shows up and it's you got to go, how did he find out where they were? But then if he knew the entire time, why did they bother with the going into the FBI building and hurting Skinner? And then why did he kill the other doctors in the previous episode if they just wanted to see what Scully was going to give birth to? Mm. What? And just his heel turn from villain to participant like everyone else. It was just... Did you... Again, it was just two episodes compressed down. Or did you really not have a way to resolve this. I know these. this is like a new breed of alien. We don't even know how it's really connected to the colonists and no. all the rest of it. But at the same time, the colonists wouldn't have let a witness go. No. Even if Scully had given birth to something normal after all this, they would have vaporised her. Yeah. So that was weird. And I, I, I'm in two minds because I kind of like the religious ecstasy idea of they have... I don't like that fan theory so much. I like the theory that they had to witness this for some reason. Mm. And that's how I took it for all those years is they just wanted to be there for this moment for some reason. And that never paid off. And the fan explanation does explain why it never paid off. But at the same time, you want to go, that's really yeah. dissatisfying. I must admit, I like your reading, but I think the fan explanation makes more sense. It does. And that's kind of disappointing again, because it feels like we've had, we've had they've touched on alien and how aliens and how they relate to God before. Jeremiah Smith was the big one for this. Yeah. And we've never gone back to that extent of exactly how these dynamics play out. Because God to aliens should seem really weird unless there's some truth in it. Because aliens, we imagine, are more understanding of the universe and higher level intelligence. Mm. And 
the fact that Jeremiah Smith doesn't just dismiss out of hand is interesting. But we've never gone back to it to really sort of dig into how it works. I always liked the Arthur C. Clarke explanation of uh, advanced technology looking like magic to us. Yeah. But I think that plays best for me in Miracle Man. Because yes. there is that comment about how they just found him as a child. And we said at the time that's something that you can really, really tie into the conspiracy if you want to. I oh, know, we, wait, we waited for Jeremiah Smith to pull yeah, it back to it. But, but yeah. because the miracle, the boy in Miracle Man's abilities are so similar to Jeremiah Smith's, yeah. you could argue that this is a alien that's been raised as human. Yeah, and again, it points to the whole... No one, no one in the series used that. Mm. It feels like it should be a gimme that you could have retroactively said, oh my God. Was that some of the accident happened there? This was a throwaway line we had, but we could totally use this. Yeah, and it it's not using it for anything. I know, I know in other series this can be really annoying if you do that, but that feels like such a well set up thing that they didn't use. Yeah. The other thing that makes me think this could be like two episodes collapsed into one is Crychek's motivation just sort of doing a one eighty, very fast. This is faster than normal for Crychek. I feel. Mulder, I think, expresses it nicely in this episode when he calls Kryzik a coward, is we always know that Kryzik will jump onto whichever team he thinks he's winning at any given time. This is fair. It just felt like there needed to be a little more build-up for him. It's just a bit too quick switching sides. It should be noted, uh, I read an interview with Nicholas Lee about this episode in particular and about his feelings towards Kryzik, and he was really happy to be killed off at this point. Okay. Because when they announced the fact that they were planning to kill him off in this episode... He felt at the time he was getting bored of playing Kryzik, and the reason he gave for it was the fact that Kryzik's motivations are never clear and are never explained. And he thought that, you know, the character really needed some clarity to him, that he was never being given. That's fair. You can only be portentous and keep saying you just don't understand the true picture when you know the true picture and refuse point blank to ever tell anyone what's going on. Interestingly, Mitch Pleggy was also really happy about Krajic's episode, <laughs> this episode, because in his interview he said it's nothing to do with not liking Nicholas Lee at all, but from Skinner's perspective is this is what Skinner really wants. If someone is going to kill Krajic, Skinner would want to be the one to do this after all the shit Krajic has pulled on him. Yeah. I think one thing I would have added to this if I was involved was basically Krajic still got the remote on him and Skinner just stamps on it and makes sure no one can do that to him ever again. It's yeah. Like, that's a weird because the nano machines are now functionally dropped. We will never hear of them again. Maybe in that bit where Krajic was reaching for his gun, it could have been the remote. Yeah, it's odd that he was like nudging the gun with his fake hand. It just it felt an odd choice. Mm. Krajic's death sequence as well was also one of Kim Manor's favourite scenes he ever shot. They actually put extra budget aside so they could do that slow mo CGI shot of Krajic being shot. Ah. Uh. Pity they didn't put it into the editing where he changes posture between camera cuts. Yeah, I did think that was a bit jarring because he was on all fours, but then at the point the CGI shot, it, he's either kneeling or standing up. And it looks really off. Yeah. That was confusing. Shall we talk a little bit about Rail? What do you want to say about Dal and Monica? Ah, well, I really like Monica, and I do like the fact that we have left off with a pretty blatant assertion that here is your new X-Files division. That final scene with the two of them in Kirsch's office is actually quite a nice way to introduce our new X-Files. Yes. I mean, to be fair, I think when Kirsch does say, you know, you've done this over my head and everything, and Dogger does have a solution for that, but it's that I do think the New Orleans branch are going to say, sorry, what? No, she's due back in work on Monday. Get her back here. Hey, guys, not coming back. Yeah, I'm in I, Washington I, now. Yeah, I transferred to the main bureau. Bye. But... I do remember way back in the day, I think I said this last time, but I'll reiterate again, is that I was convinced she was going to turn out to be treacherous somehow. And it, it's not so much entirely the smoking thing, but it is still an odd tick to give her. When everyone else who's villainous, because I realised the last time we discussed this, we left off William Mulder. Yeah, sure. Who is also massively compromised. Mm. But smoking seems to be a shorthand for evil in the X-Files. It's even to the degree of things like three of a kind when Scully is under the influence of the drug that affects her behaviour and she starts smoking. Exactly. So it's it's an odd detail to give her character if you're not setting her up as a villain. Mm. The whole It's actually kind of weird to see her smoking again when she was trying to quit last time. And the other thing that really kind of makes her suspect in this episode, and I, I'm pretty sure it's unintentional, is she cleans up an entire, what was that, a saloon? That massive room she cleaned and scrubbed clean of everything and got all the cobwebs down, did the laundry apparently in a matter of hours. 
I'm not sure with how dilapidated that building is and what she had to hand, you could deep clean a room no, like that. No, it was really odd, wasn't it? Immaculate, even with all the clean start sheets. Yeah, it's a, Monica, it's a, a bunch of people up back helping you, and it's as good as a thing as surprise. It's going to be, surprise, you're being abducted again. That whole industrial laundrette out the back, apparently. <laughs> yeah, and in some ways, I don't know if it's just me or it was intentional. You're meant to be not quite sure of Monica the entire way through. Like, how quickly she gives up when the super soldiers, you know, she finds out that a whole bunch of super soldiers are here, and Billy Miles has got up again. I was never suspicious of Monica, even okay. watching this the first time, because she's so sweet. She is. And it's even her worry, and her just trying to do her level best, and how freaked out she is about the whole thing when she has that nice scene in the car with Scully. And also, her kind of, like, little bit she's trying, like, talking about the whale songs and things. Yeah. It, she's just so sweet. It's not the same bad feeling you got for the likes of Phoebe Green and Diane Fowley when they appeared. No, not at all. But that was an interesting point because there is a throwaway line from Scully that Monica reminds her of Melissa. Yes. And with that thought in tow, it feels like Reyes was actually created from leftover ideas that Melissa never got to do because he was killed. And some lingering stuff from Fowley. She feels like a weird amalgam of the two of them. There is a bit of Fowley's competency in there and Fowley's interest in the occult. But you've also got with the whale song a bit of Melissa's new agey. Well, also her feeling energy vibes and everything. It's yeah. Very Melissa. So obviously Melissa would have never been become an FBI agent, but I do wonder if Monica... I, I do, I'm do. i not going to stress, I do like Monica, but if she's actually just built out of parts... It's a bit of a sad outlook to her because is. I really, really like Monica. I, I think like she's a too. lovely character. She is. And I think that's good. And I think that's also Anna Gish helps out a lot. I just don't want to credit Chris Carter with too much because I don't, don't have a lot of respect <laughs> for him anymore. He's got kind of eroded it away. I think you're letting your feelings cloud your judgment. Yeah. But I'm also interested to see how this is going to go into season nine just because. Uh, I know they're friends, but Doggett and Monica are absolute polar different characters, much like Mulder and Scully used to be. So I think it's going to be really nice to see those two personalities playing off each other. Yeah, and it's also curious to have the the gender flip thing. Mm. Uh, which the is, female believer. Yes, and it does also remind me a bit of Alex Hirsch for Gravity Falls, because he was asked why he put it that way around with Dipper being a believer and Mabel being you know more sceptical. Yeah. And I think he his response was um, basically that around the time Gravity Falls is you tend to get the inverse. So like with um, Monica and Dogger would be your expected way of having a dynamic like that. It must be said, I think we commented on this right back at the start of the X-Files, is that is what you expect, is men are scientific and analytical and women are more open to kind of holistic approaches, let's say. Yeah. So uh, in, Gravity Falls kind of di diverges off that because to say, <laughs> Kevin, applying some of that to Mabel is that uh, that's a bit of a stretch, I feel. I love Mabel, but she's not um, scientific and grounded. She likes stickers. And pigs, yes. I like Monica Reyes in this, and I do think a lot of... There's some weirdness, though, that it's just with how the episode's been framed and shot. And just that, in, the plausibility of cleaning things up like that. And then I want to go with Noel Raw's cover story as well. Oh, the one about um, government super soldiers. Yeah, and we finally got the term because we were trying not to allude to it last week, but at least we were only one episode off actually mentioning that. The term. whole arc is collectively called the super so soldier arc, so it's been hard to kind of yeah. not say that. The line that Royal tries to give Doggett is, Doggett, why did you even entertain this? Because, okay, so, so Nor Royal says, okay, so Billy Miles is the first of a new military project. Yeah, we kind of feed back into that debate we had back in season two where we asked people to vote on whether they thought that was an UFO or a helicopter that took Scully away, yeah. and everyone said it's a helicopter. Yes. Uh, this is back to that idea of the fact that there's nothing extraterrestrial about what happened to Scully. It was all a clandestine military experiment yeah. that gave her cancer and also caused her pregnancy. Yeah, but before the logic through with what he says happened mm. is they abducted Scully to make her... To put a chip into the back of her neck. Mm -hmm. That was in season two. Yeah. Three years later, they gave her cancer. Yep. And then two years after that, they made her pregnant. Yep. What are you doing, people? It's a very long <laughs> experiment. <laughs> and also, apparently, it doesn't matter. Well, the, and the other part, though, is from his telling of it, it doesn't matter that Scully had that chip extracted, lost it, 
and Mulder implanted a completely different chip into the back of her neck. Who are we to question the science, Nick? <laughs> what science is nonsense? I think also that Doggett doesn't say, hang on, hang on, hang on, Noel. You're telling me that you can induce pregnancy in people, get them to create some kind of genetic super soldier. With a chip? With a chip. This is, this is what the military is doing. Who really knows what computers do anyway? <laughs> It's just the fact that Doggett entertaining you for a second is that this sounds wilder than some of the X-Files you've done, Doggett. I think there's more... It's the way conspiracy theories work, is if you give it a grounding like that, they are easier to believe than aliens flew down and do this. That's true. But it's still... It's absolutely bizarre thing to even entertain, isn't it? I mean, the questions I think... My questions would be that Doggett has read all the X-Files. So we'll have read that Scully was a tangential part of the Dwayne Barry case. Yeah. And Dwayne Barry grabbed her, and then she got whisked away by parties unknown yeah. and given the chip. I'd like him to sort of press back and say, so what was going on with Dwayne Barry then? How did that work? Because everyone, everyone, everyone kind of just slides off that bit of, as much as you can say this is the government doing it in the military, how does Dwayne Barry factor into this? I think the bigger problem I have is that Doggett is so quick to believe the source. Which yeah. even Mulder hits on later when he says, has Noel ever lied to you? Like, Doggett <laughs> knows he has. Doggett has confronted him about lying before. It was literally the last time they spoke. Yeah. So why are we so quick to eat up what Noel Ross says now? <laughs> I guess because it has that kind of little grain of truth in it. Yeah. But at the same time, I kind of want to say, based on this episode, that the super soldiers are kind of rubbish. They can regenerate from a single vertebra. That's awesome. No, 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 no. That, that part of them is awesome. And I do kind of like the fact they're bringing Billy Miles and the autopsy for Billy Miles in this case of, is this it? It's like, oh, well, he's sausage meat. <laughs> Except for this one metal vertebra that survived. I so, really like that CGI shot of it kind of multiplying as well. That's really, really neat. Yeah. So does that then imply that when they reform the first time, they are just bone with one metal vertebra and now his entire skeleton will be metal? Well, they have multiple bumps on their back, so I'm going to go at the very least their entire spinal column is metallic. But they only found one vertebra after the crush, crushing by the... Yeah, but truck. that didn't look like enough to be a full person there. No, either. that's what I mean. So maybe the rest is in the garbage truck somewhere. It could be. We didn't see Scully, uh, Skinner get in trouble for the whole, yes, you hide a garbage truck to kill someone. It was a tragic accident. And uh, also Agent Crane, or whatever he is, helped the escape and killed Bester Weir. Thinking of it in the terms of, is it Mystery Men with the person who fell down that elevator shaft onto some bullets? Yeah, I, it, uh, once they removed from the Simpsons one, of uh, like I fell over and these bullets like drove their way into me. Yeah. The fact that you can outrun a super soldier feels odd to me. That chase sequence, I both love it and hate it. it, it you, I said how when we were watching this, is this really the climax of this season? So he kind of does the... Terminator run after the T-1000 run leaps onto the side of the car and then gets um, hit by that pillar. Yeah. Well, it's where they sort of, you know, they run over him and they can't see anything. They think, oh, everything's fine. He just sort of, sort of swoops in from the side. It's hysterical. <laughs> but it's the fact though you've got, I mean, one thing you've got the, t the T-1000 run pursuing the T-1000, which is a strange image at the best of times. Yeah. But it's, uh, they do all the parkour and the chasing and, you know, he slams him into the pillar. It's a, uh, I know they're technically indestructible, but they are being wiped out really easily. And no we're all just drove into that wall. We know they are super strong as well because Billy Miles decapitated that guy with a swing of his hand in the previous episode. Well, he punches through the lift and gives a yeah. minor skin or a concussion in this one. So if they all have these same attributes, they've all got to be that level of strong. Yeah, so what's going on with these two? Mm. Why are they just kind of worthless? They're the bargain basement ones. Oh, they were Generation 1. Wasn't yeah, uh, it's like um, iPod Generations. Yeah. Oh, that, that, so, so going to Noel Rawls' cover story, mm. is again, it feels like a vital question that Mulder doesn't ask. And it, this one feels really bad he doesn't. So Noel Rawls says, Billy Miles is the first generation of a new super soldier program that the government has been doing, and Scully is Generation 2. Yeah. So Billy, so Billy Miles, no point does anyone say, hang on. The government did Billy Miles. So Billy Miles disappeared at the same time as Mulder and was returned under very similar circumstances. So you're saying the US government did this to Mulder. Does he have grounds to sue? And why did whatever the government did to Billy Miles not happen to Mulder? What were they doing? 
And there should be a lot of questions of, sorry, you, Mordor has described what he went through for seven months. You did this to him, is what you're saying. And I understand why that was not on no one's mind when they're writing this, but your cover story has a lot of problems. Yeah, yeah. Eminently thinking quick on his feet is not Noel Rose's thing. <laughs> no, because, I mean, just, just admitting any of that, I mean, he could just say, it's ultra classified, I can be shot if I tell you. Go with that. Yeah. On the whole, I don't think it's a bad episode. It's exciting enough. Everyone has something to do, even though Scully's is just giving birth. Well, again, we say we get to the real downside is that Scully's once again lumbered with a thankless role. She mm. has a few funny lines, but in general, it's uh, you can't do anything. You're basically incapacitated. Halfway through the episode, you're going to start giving birth. Yeah. And you get to be paranoid about everyone who's come to watch you give birth, which I imagine a deeply uncomfortable experience, really, having a masked witness to you giving birth. You think of like all those kind of am I the asshole and similar posts about who's allowed in the room when the baby's born. I still get bogged down with the whole they were literally trying to kill everyone last episode and now they do until Scully is about to give birth and they stop. I, it's just the cons- inconsistency annoys me. Like why Billy Miles is even there if he just wants to win. Because he can still speak. He can say, I mean you no harm. I'm just here. I just want. I just need to be here for this. Childbirth is a beautiful thing. The super soldiers did not realise it up until this point. <laughs> they were in so in awe of Scully's beautiful child and the miracle of childbirth that they completely changed their mind about murdering everyone. That's rubbish. But I think that's the best we've got. Yeah. So, one last thing for me, at least, is we... I was sure we were getting the parentage of as we now know him to be William in this episode, but no, we do not. We get some implications, sure, but we get nothing concrete at all. I'm not sure anybody actually knows the parentage of this baby, to be no honest. Seems, even Scully. Everyone seems to have stopped caring as well, which is deeply odd. But, I mean, you've got to infer something by saying he's named for your father to Mulder. You don't usually do that unless there's a reason to do it. It doesn't acknowledge the fact that Scully's dad's also called Bill. Yeah, and that feels like, again, this is written by Chris Carter person who created the characters come to think of it isn't one of scully's brothers called bill as well yeah there is another bill's so there are a lot of williams in scully's life there yeah, so what what are you doing lady and i did kind of i wanted to, i said to you as well though when you've actually get finally get to see scully and her child because they suddenly tried to play up the concern because it's like Rhea says it's going to get to a hospital then you don't see her for a, until the last scene it's kind of like the whole something's gone wrong or something's gone scully's died in the interim or something but when we eventually saw her, I did kind of want it to turn into Bloodborne, and she's like the doll creating the, the new godling. Oh, the, the squid. <laughs> I wanted that to be the last shot. <laughs> Interesting. Do you know who that baby actor is in this one? Go on, then. That's John Shaban's son. Oh, okay. He's the first of seven different babies that played Baby William, and that's the only time it is played by John Shaban's son. Ah. But our first ever William. William, no last name specifies. I don't know if he takes on anyone. I guess we got to assume he's William Scully at the yeah. moment. Yeah, because they're not married, as far as we can tell. That's there's a whole galaxy of conundrum over this relationship, because we have a romantic kiss. I was about to say the episode does end on probably the most romantic kiss Mulder and Scully have ever had. Yes, they've had a few now, but that's been the most tender and the kind of most meaningful. Yes, and it's really remarkable to then note that um, David Duchovny will not be appearing until the end of season nine now. Yep, that's him that's basically out. out. Yeah. No, should we wrap up the season? We can wrap up the season. So, season nine is sorry, season eight was interesting in the full. This is the first, the major first major shakeup of the cast. Yeah. Like this is more it's more so than adding Skinner in or even bringing in some of the more other recurring people. Is that this was the first huge change to everything? Yeah. And is interesting. I don't know what to put it to. It's either Robert Patrick is a better actor than David Duchovny or that whole financial mess with David Duchovny meant that people weren't writing him in the same way just because Mulder's a complete unbearable jerk for most of the season. Yes, better. 
he is better than his last two episodes, but his first, his return episode was really obnoxious. I think probably up to and including Viennan. You've got yeah. Mulder being a jerk for most of the season. And i got to wonder, is that basically behind the scenes, no one was happy with each other, so this was not conducive to making his character come across? Yeah. Or is it simply poor writing? Because season eight, we don't feel exhausted like we did in season seven. At the same time, it's transparently clear that no one knew what they were doing anymore. This yeah. is very flailing. We have to keep going, but we don't know if we're going to go on any further. Yeah. We did note last time as well that up until the last couple of episodes, they didn't know if X-Files was going to be renewed. Existence could have been the finale. Yes. And I think, I mean, we'll always have to revisit this uh, further down the line, but you can certainly say that, yeah, you could have ended the X-Files here, and there are lingering questions, but you've resolved most of the villains. The super soldiers seem to no longer be a threat. Cancer Man's been dead for an entire season. You know, Mulder and Scully are happy together, Scully's yeah. baby is safe, and Doggett and Reyes are going to continue their legacy. Yeah. You might get a spin-off series, possibly, or something you could pick up again in the future, but there's no need to do anything immediately. Mm. The fact that season nine has to now deal with a very weird landscape did not, doesn't, it's not going to make the start of the next season easy. No, true. Because this is, this is the first time since Fight the Future in the end where we've had, there's no lead into the next season per se. Yeah, it's pretty rounded off. Even though at this point we did know there was going to be a season nine. Yeah, but it's not not clear what it was going to entail. So I think the conspiracy, the conspiracy episodes are they're trying, but they're lapsing back to what they know, and what they know is colony. I thought, as I've already said, the conspiracy for me peaked around season four or five. Yeah. I think this is about the weakest the conspiracy has been in this season. Yeah, I think it's because... I think it's not only that we're trying to redo Colony and Endgame, we're trying to do the same goal of the aliens. And we don't know that there's anything on the government side to do it anymore. Yeah, I feel with the Shadow Syndicate now gone, we are really scrabbling, because we've left a vacuum. Yeah. Oh, no, we also come back to the point we made last week of why are the aliens not just vaporising the planet? What is holding them up now? The syndicate's gone. They were kind of the block that was slowing everything down, and they're gone. Assuming these guys are the same colonists, which, through the use of purity, we kind of assume they are. We do kind of assume they are. At the same time, though, if they can make super soldiers, even though it takes them months to do it, it's just ramp that up. You'll get there eventually. It'll be like um, Invasion of the Body Snatchers or Quatermass 2. Yeah. It's just a factor of time until unless you stop it dead. Mm. And there's no one in, in a position to do things. Because that's one of the weird three lines of the X-Files is like everyone's afraid, the government is afraid of the X-Files or the Shadow Syndicate is afraid of the X-Files and being exposed to the truth. And I think season 11 actually will touch on the whole, that's not true. Yeah. That's absolutely ridiculous idea to even consider. We're not there yet. But at the same time, on retrospect, it's there. Yeah, the X-Files aren't going to scare anyone. Because what are they going to do? Nah. Again, you put Mordor on a court stand, he's going to look like an absolutely insane maniac. My lawyers are going to make you look so stupid. As the guy in Arcadia said. Yeah, and it's hard to get past that. Is that... Well, I think not least because he's already done it to himself more than once. Like, Tombs is the big one. No, no, I, no, I don't, can't disagree <laughs> with this at all. So yeah, I'd say conspiracy is its weakest, and it's not even really worth thinking about because we don't even know how it functionally works there's not even any kind of portentous hints at what's going on other than we're replacing people with super soldiers who are going to put down any rebellion okay and you know the bees and the virus and everything was a kind of building on things as they went and it was a slow reveal of stuff and now we've got black oil is defeated apparently it was a less slow burn idea with the virus and the bees because it was that idea of how a pandemic works in the fact we are building something and when we release it there will be no stopping it yeah whereas this is a lot more slow burn it's that we're replacing people one at a time until we've got an overwhelming majority essentially yeah again just the whole just vaporize the planet go on speed things up i'll say unfortunately though if we flip to the other side of things is these are probably some of the worst monster of the week episodes we've seen in the entire run to date. I don't know about worst, but they're certainly underwhelming. Blacklist of them. Yeah, there's nothing that really, bar a couple, really stood out as being exemplary ones. Yeah, and 
the other thing you, I sort of think we can make a comment of is there isn't a comedy episode. No. I, I know people were upset that they had increasing numbers of them, but there were none this time. I think your closest is possibly alone because it does have comedic elements to it, but yeah. it's not a comedy episode. No. It's not. And again, it does kind of point to the whole why Humbug worked and why Darren Morgan's ones were good breaks in the whole ethos. Yeah, you did overwhelm it after a point and there were too many, but you need to break up the monotony. Even some of Vince Gilligan's really tongue-in-cheek character studies worked very well as well. Yeah, it's just something like that. And um, I don't know if he's written any this mu- this season. I don't believe he has, but then again, he was working on Lone Gunman. Yeah, and put a pin in that because we're going to have to talk about that in a minute. But yeah, it was uh, frustrating that even uh, the thing you can hold on to, which is the Mark Rose world, there'll be something in here and it's... Oh. We, we, we've we assembled lists. I feel we've tried to uh, get a list of things. I, I tried to poll people on Twitter, as I always do, but just people don't want to talk about Season 8, apparently. So I don't have a comparison we can do with what the populace at large think and what the fans think of the season. But we can talk about what we liked and disliked, at least. We can. I, well, I, I am so, the scholarship is who I imagine the most hardcore probably like the implications of the second half. Of it. Yeah. I mean, you're given basically all the The few answers I've got, which again, weren't enough to kind of make a fan top list this time. People seem to prefer the conspiracy episodes to the Monster of the Week ones in this. So I think you're on the head. It's a very personal season for Mulder and Scully, and that's what the fans liked. So do you want to give your top five best episodes? I I would. So in reverse order. So at number five, I've got Roadrunners. Okay. Pretty much classic X-Files episode. It's grisly. It's got monster things. Don't really like with that was the start of really Scully losing anything to do and being victimized all the time. So that that was bad as a precedent. Uh, Red Room, I've got for number four. Mm-hmm. Number three, I put Salvage. Okay. And number two, Surekill. Uh-huh. And number one is Alone. Okay, it's similar to my list, but not the same. I figured it'd be. I I was looking at them, going, yeah, I can make a case for these ones, and then what have you got? I've got Sure Kill in five. Okay. Uh, Alone in four. Yep. Vienna in three. Ooh, okay. Roadruns in two, though I do agree with your points about Scully. I think it's the scariest episode in the season. It's yeah. Tremendously it, creepy. It's just a problem of what it kind of heralds first, the rest of it. And I'm going to give number one to Red Rum. Fair enough. I'm still very fond of Red Rum. I think it's the superior version to Monday. Yes, I can see that. It's that Mon- concept, but... For me, it's more satisfying in Red Room. Well, and also Monday was not as fun as I remember it being. Yeah. So what about your worst? I've actually done a top five for my worst, which I've never got out of a season before. Oh, I, I did it too, but it, uh, it wasn't, wasn't um, a difficult one. In fact, I think I rearranged it a few times. <laughs> so I, number five, I put This Is Not Happening. Okay. And I don't think it's anything particular. It's just the conspiracy bugs me so much in this season. And This Is Not Happening was like, it's the fact you have to have people shout this is not happening and it just never works as something people would shout in frustration ever. Mm. Just completely unbelievable. Uh, number four, I put Badler. Okay. Which I was tempted to put higher up. I thought, yeah, I know I can make cases, but you know, Badler is basically indefensible. Trash. Trash. It's, in, it's indefensible. It's a, it's, a, it's a concept that they've done a few times and I think this is the least sensitive of the lot of them. Yeah. And also the least coherent because what even was going on by the end of it was so unclear because Teleco has its problems but I understand what the creature in Teleco wanted yeah I don't know what Badler was about uh number three I put Empedocles just because god damn that episode Mm. but then I'm possibly going to be controversial but number two I put Essence okay number one is Existence okay I cheated a bit then in that case okay Uh, number five is Essence and Existence, which I've counted as one thing. <laughs> hey, I'll take that. Actually, I think the important point to qualify is that there is a case to be made for these episodes being better than we've kind of indicated at the same time. This is really bad as a tail end of your season. It was the religious symbolism and for me. I, I think they lay it on far too thick. Yeah, it's the, there, are, there are bits where they could have gone further, and I don't understand why they didn't go the whole hog with how far they've gone, like, Having that quote from Exodus on the door as they go into the place of the skills given yeah. birth. It's, it's, this is, and the light in the sky, it's the... The Jesus stained glass window that's kind of shining down onto her yeah. bed. As, you want to say, though, if 
if you just had the alien ship overhead as a stand-in for the star, that would have been more subtle than what you did. Number four, I've got the gift. I did, considered the gift and thought, no, I hate these other ones more. Uh, three, I've got Empedocles. But uh, given your reaction when I said we've got to watch Empedocles today, I was not, not surprised that showed up. I, I've always hated that episode. Two is Via Negativa, which I oh, will yeah. caveat is it's because it's an idea wasted. i will go with that one. The concept of Via Negativa is great. The execution is appalling. Yes. And it's, I think even when we're trying to synopsize it, it's the third wrong footing where you think you know what's going on and then the same person just comes back to the same scene and kills someone. Mm. And you go, what? What's your number one? Badler. Yeah. <laughs> it's just... It, no. I've seen a lot of people argue that Badler is the worst episode of the X-Files. And it does have some Tesos Dos Bichos related contenders, but it is abysmal. Yeah. I think... I, w- I wonder if it's one of the things is Tesos Dos Bichos, we know some of that was budgetary reasons. They were they were trying to do something and he couldn't have actually thought to do it. Badler, no one has offered an excuse for what happened. That seemed to have executed how they wanted it to. It's just incoherent. It's also a step back in things we haven't seen for a while. You mentioned Teleco, but it's episodes like Fresh Bones and Teleco, which were accused at the time of being racially insensitive. And the X-Files had done pretty well at moving away from that for a while. Mm. And then, then made Badler. Yeah. And again, though, I still think what Badler marked out differently to the rest of them is... As much as those episodes were kind of weird, I mean, especially Tetris Bitchos is very confusing. Yeah. There is at least a goal that the monster has, where Badler is, they set up a whole lot of possible goals, and it turns out to be none of them. Yeah. And then the actual way his power works is contradictory, depending on which part of the episode you're in. So what about Best Monster? Uh, I had only one, po- I did look through a few of them and thought, yeah, 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 yeah. but I have, I'll go for one, Ray Pierce. Yeah, I've got Ray Pierce as well. <laughs> so that's the Metal Man from Salvage. Yes. it's. I thought he had interesting motives. I like the idea of him becoming less human and more machine. And I thought the prosthetics in that episode were really the best thing about the episode. They're fantastic. Yeah. I think, um, the, but I think the downside to it is I think it should have been in a longer thing than an X-Files episode. But it's like Tetsuro does, goes in a very strange direction with this. But you can see the Salvage idea having been derived from Tetsuro, but what it's trying to do is a bit different, but it's not got enough time to do it in. It's yeah. 45 minutes is not enough for this. And of course, it didn't really get into all kind of Tetsuo's homoerotic imagery. No. So, normally, you'd think we'd be going on to season nine now. For a variety of reasons, we aren't. And some of this is because of, well, it's entirely because of Lone Goodman, because we're going to watch Lone Goodman series. Yay. Yeah. It was a one season it runs, so that's 13 episodes. Yeah. And the, it's the weird complexities of you can technically get away without watching it up to a point. An episode would be Jump the Shark, where we need to know what happens in the season to make sense of that. But their entrance in the first episode of the season nine doesn't really hinge on how Lungerman ends, but it does refer to it. So there's a weird bit there. And there's a conspiracy episode part way through, which does not have an explanation if you've not watched Long Gunman. Because what how the situation Long Gunman are in, I don't know is it actually explained anywhere. Because someone had to tell me out of context what was going on. So long story short, just so everything is clear and we can talk about things fairly, we are going to spend the next few podcasts talking about the Long Gunman. Yes. The next next episode will be Pilot and just wincing. Bond Jimmy Bond. Oh my god, that's the title. Of course, Nick will be reviewing this in a very unbiased way. <laughs> anyway, if you'd like to get hold of us in the meantime, if you're a passionate defender of Lundgren, we'd actually love to hear from you. Our email address is thingsagainststrange42 at gmail.com. You can also find us on social media, and please do hook me up if you'd like me to promote anything X-Files related at the start of the show, from conventions to zines to fun fan things you got on the go. You can find us on Twitter and Tumblr at getstrange 42 on Mastodon at GetStrange42 at Universodon.com, or on Facebook where you can find us by searching for Things Are Getting Strange in X-Files Rewatch podcast. Also, if you're not sick of my voice right now, I also stream live on Twitch TV under the name AdverseCamber42. My main stream is live Mondays and Wednesdays at 8pm GMT and Saturdays at 5pm GMT. I am currently playing Silent Hill 2 Remake and Life is Strange 2, though by the time it says I might have finished Life is Strange 2, after which I'll be moving on to Psychonauts. 
we have a Patreon, patreon.com slash things are getting strange, where for as little as $3 a month, you can have access to our bonus stuff, which includes a complete, well, let's play of the X-Files game from 1998, the FMV one with Craig Wilmore, where we managed to kill him a lot. Oh my, yes. We got, we eventually got him to the happy ending. It's still weird to me that he didn't actually have the scene where he reunites with his love interest. They just saw him in outside the apartment block. Our theme music is Vision by Kevin McLeod. You can find that on Compotech.com. License under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0. Thank you all for listening, and until next time, please remember, trust, trust no one. one.